Before the British and the French and the Dutch started building their colonies, Spain was the leader and primary claimant to European authority in the Americas. Under the authority of the Pope, they laid claim to a huge swath of territory across the American continents, from the southern tip of South America all the way to southern Canada. But over time, Spanish power waned and other powers, the British, the French, even the Russians, started to encroach on territory that the Spanish thought was theirs. In 1789, the Spanish attempted to enforce their authority at the extreme edge of the territory that they nominally controlled, and an argument over the control of one of the most remote places on earth nearly led to war in Europe. It is history that deserves to be remembered. Spain, by financing Christopher Columbus's expedition that ended with the European discovery of the Caribbean, claimed nearly the entirety of the New World for themselves especially the entirety of the Pacific coast. Their claim was supported by the papal bull, Intercatera, which divided the Western Hemisphere into Portuguese and Spanish zones. Portugal and Spain debated the exact location of the dividing line, eventually moving it west in the Treaty of Tordesillas. While it would take several hundred years for any European to successfully cross modern Canada or the United States, in 1513, Vasco Nunez de Balboa first sighted the Pacific Ocean from American shores which would lead the Spanish to lay claim to the entire coastline. European monarchies instituted the doctrine of discovery as a means to legitimize colonization efforts, ignoring the fact that the lands that they laid claim to were already inhabited. In an effort to secure the right of prior discovery, several Spanish voyages explored the coast. In 1542, a Spanish voyage reached at least as far as Northern California, while further journey in 1602 reached the modern coast of Southern Oregon. Spain, however, was largely absorbed with draining wealthy South American states, while other nations began colonizing the east coast of the modern United States and Canada. Exploration of the east coast of the American continued, but it wasn't until 1741 that Russian explorer Vitus Bering brought European influence to the far northern Pacific coast after sailing along the southern coast of Alaska, a voyage that is the topic of another episode of The History Guy. The Spanish immediately recognized the Russian exploration as a threat to their claims in the New World. To combat Russian influence, the Spanish began aggressively sending explorations north from their settlements in Mexico and their most northern province in Alta California. Beginning in 1774, Spanish expeditions were sent to northern Canada and modern Alaska, clear to Kodiak Island, to shore up their claims of prior discovery. By 1775, Spanish explorers had reached the mouth of the Columbia River, which divides much of modern Oregon and Washington State. The 1774 expedition was meant to place crosses with bottles containing claims of the area, but thanks to weather, nothing was left behind, although some were left behind successfully in 1775. Spanish exploration also included new settlements, which were established as far north as San Francisco. Simultaneously, exploration from other corners was beginning to encroach on the region. French and then British fur trappers were slowly working their way west, while by sea, British explorer James Cook reached the region in 1778. In 1774, the Spanish Navy ship Santiago reached the modern Nutka Sound on the western coast of modern Vancouver Island. The Spanish didn't land, although they did trade with some natives who paddled out to the ship. In 1778, James Cook reached the same sound, this time landing and speaking with the locals at some length. He recorded the natives called it Nutka Sound, although that isn't the native name. One explanation that he may have mistaken the native word for around, meaning island, but it isn't clear how Cook misunderstood. The First Nations settlement on Nutka Island is Yukwat, meaning where the wind blows from all directions. The settlement on Nutka Island was for generations the traditional summer home of a group of First Nations people, and was where McQuinna, the Nukkanoth chief, lived with as many as 1,500 other people. McQuinna may have met Cook, although Cook did not record the leader's name, and dubbed the place Friendly Cove. Nutka represented an excellent site for European trade, providing a protected anchorage for trading ships. It would quickly become one of the most important sites in the region in the growing competition between European nations. Despite the Spanish claim on the region, beginning around 1785, there was a concerted effort by British traders, supported by the government, to develop a fur trade on the Pacific coast, inspired by Cook's visit there. Spain vigorously opposed English efforts. By 1787, the Spanish learned that the Russians were preparing a force to occupy and establish a settlement at Nutka. In 1788, John Mears, a British fur trader, arrived at Yukwat in the hopes of building a permanent settlement in the area. 
Mears would later claim that he purchased a spot of land from Maquinna and built a trading post on the island. Though British, Mears' ships flew Portuguese flags, were registered in Macau. That was actually to avoid trouble with the East India Company as British ships needed permits to trade in the region. While there, Mears' men built the sloop Northwest America, the first non-indigenous ship built in the region. Mears traveled around the region claiming sections for the British. He informed McQuinna he would return the following year to build more houses. The viceroy in Mexico was extremely interested in pushing off the various powers and instructed his men to show Russia and English vessels the superior right which we have for continuing such establishments on the whole coast. He referenced Cook, who arrived four years after the first Spanish arrival at Nutka, and the fact that Cook purchased two silver spoons at Nutka, supposedly stolen from the earlier Spanish voyage. The Spanish sent Sub-Lieutenant Esteban José Martínez with two ships to enforce Spanish sovereignty in 1789. Martínez was instructed to occupy the Sound, build a fort and settlement, and generally make it clear to both the British and the Russians that the Spanish meant to defend the region. Martínez established a settlement, dubbed Santa Cruz de Nuca, the first European settlement in modern British Columbia, and a fort called Fort San Miguel with ten cannons. They had orders to prevent any other nation from intercourse and commerce with the natives. When Martinez arrived on May 5, 1789, there were three ships already in the Sound. The first American ships to reach the region had wintered there, the Columbia Redaviva and the later Washington. Also present was one of Mears' party's ships, the Iphigenia Nubiana. While the Spanish were busy fortifying their position, Mears had returned to China, where he formed a partnership called the Associated Merchants Trading to the northwest coast of America. Martinez remained on good terms with the Americans, but he seized the British ship and arrested its captain. Martinez released the captain after a short time and told him to leave. The British ship vacated the sound promptly. On June 8th, the Northwest America returned to Nutka Sound and was immediately seized. Martina renamed the ship Santa Gertrudis La Magna and used it to explore the region. Legally, Martinez claimed that the Northwest America's captain had abandoned the ship and that the vessel was held as security for supplies that Martinez had given the Avenginia when he sent out the crew packing. On June 24th, Martinez performed a formal act of sovereignty, claiming the whole coast up to Nutka for Spain. On June 14th, the British ship Princess Royal arrived, but Martinez apparently did not feel that he had the power to order it to leave, and instead, relations were relatively polite. Princess left on July 1st. Almost immediately after, a second British ship arrived, the Argonaut, under Captain Colnett. He had orders from Mears to construct a solid establishment, and not one that is to be abandoned at pleasure, after the temporary house that had built a year before. But now the Argonaut arrived to find the whole sound declared a Spanish port, the following events are described differently by the various people involved, but the situation quickly escalated. On July 2nd or 3rd, depending on the source, Martinez was welcomed aboard the Argonaut. Martinez pressed Colnett on the English captain's intentions, and Colnett said that he came as governor of this port to prevent other nations from taking part in this fur trade, and to take possession of this port of Nutka and its coast for the King of England. This clearly was directly at odds with Martinez's mission. The Argonaut was taken into the port and secured to one Spanish and one American ship. Colnett would later say that he had been tricked into entering the port by Martinez, who told him that the Spanish needed to purchase some supplies. The parties then argued over who had the better claim to the port. The following day, Colnett described the quarrel that then broke out. Entering Martinez's cabin, Colnett presented his papers, which Martinez declared were forged, and that the Englishman should not set sail until he pleased. Colnett, seeing the duplicity of the Spaniard, was speaking to his interpreter when a group of soldiers stormed the room, knocked him down, and arrested him. Colnett complained that Martinez often threatened me with instant death by hanging me as a pirate. Of course, Martinez tells the tale differently. According to him, Colnett refused to show his papers and placed his hand two or three times on his sword as if to threaten me in my own cabin and shouted, God damn Spaniard, at him. According to Martinez, he had Colnett arrested as a prisoner of war to avoid the shedding of blood. Soon afterwards, Martinez captured the Princess Royal, which was also taken into the port. Imprisoned in a small space, as the Argonaut was repaired by the Spaniards, Colnett threw himself from a porthole and nearly drowned. Meanwhile, one of McQuinn's kinsmen met Martinez on a ship and yelled at the Spanish, for which he was shot and killed. It's unclear what happened. One version relates that Martinez fired a warning shot, and a sailor shot the man thinking that Martinez had meant to hit him. It's unclear what the man was even mad about, but McQuinn thud the sound. Other accounts suggest that Martinez was trying to hit the man. 
the British ships were sent to Mexico as prizes. And then on July 29th, orders came from Mexico for Netka to be abandoned. Before he left in October, Martinez also captured an American ship, which was just arriving. Only McQuinna and his people were in Nuka in the winter of 1789-90, but the crisis was ballooning globally. The British government took a hard line, demanding the release of their men and ships in an indemnity, and refused to recognize Spain's control of the northwest coast. Madrid, meanwhile, found the British position incredible, believing their own claims to be unassailable. In 1790, the Spanish sent a new force to reoccupy Nutka, and John Mears in London published his memorial decrying Spain's actions. British politicians were soon yelling for armament. War with Spain seemed a real possibility, and Britain delivered an ultimatum. The global scene was itself in flux. Spain's traditional ally, France, was literally in the middle of revolution. Louis was still king, but the National Assembly opposed war. Britain had lost face in their fight with America and suspected that war with unstable France was possible. France was sympathetic to Spain, but in no position to fight a war with Britain. Spain was no longer the powerful empire it once was and lacked the resources to single-handedly defeat the British. In Mexico, the Viceroy released the captured American ship and on July 9th released Colnet and the British ships as well. The diplomatic maneuvering remains shrouded in mystery, and missing reports had led to a belief that official correspondence, especially between Britain and France, were destroyed. In October, Spain and Britain held the first of the Nutka Conventions, led by George Vancouver on the British side and Juan Francisco de la Bodega y Cuadra for the Spanish. Averting war, the buildings and tracts of land at Nutka Sound were to be restored to Britain. British authorities believed that all of the sound had been sold to Mears. Quadra and Vancouver spent some time with McQuinna at Uquat. The treaty also defined the rights of their governments and citizens at Nutka and elsewhere, and that trade on the coast was open to all nations. Two more conventions were held in the 1790s. The second provided John Mears with $210,000 in compensation for his real and imagined damages. And the third, signed on January 11, 1794, which led to the abandonment of Nutka entirely by all parties. Neither shall form any permanent establishment in the said port or claim any right of sovereignty, read the treaty. This was partially because by 1794, both nations were allied against France, and the Napoleonic Wars forced Nutka into the background. Despite the treaty that avoided war, important questions were less unanswered, notably the border of the Spanish claims. The Spain wanted that border to be at the latitude of the Strait of Juan de Fuca, where Victoria, British Columbia sits today, but the British wanted it to be closer to San Francisco. Most importantly, the decision altered international law by requiring actual occupation of a region to claim sovereignty, and not just the right of first discovery. The United States acquired Spain's claims to the region in 1819 under the Adams-Onus Treaty and argued they had acquired exclusive right to the region. In diplomacy over the region, Britain cited the Nutka Conventions, and the issue wasn't solved until the 1846 Oregon Treaty. McQuinna and his people continued to live in the region, although they faced removal and residential schools under Canadian law. Though small in number, descendants of McQuinna's people still live and maintain tourist sites in the area today. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The History Guy. Check out our community on thehistoryguyguild.locals.com, our webpage at thehistoryguy.com, and our merchandise at teespring.com, or book a special message from The History Guy on Cameo. And if you'd like more episodes on Forgotten History, all you have to do is subscribe.